$2.43 billion. That's how big the Australian games industry is. And there's about 68% of us that play games. But within that, there's 20% that live with a disability. So how do you make this huge gaming industry, how do you make it more accessible? Well, we have an incredible panel this week. We have Meredith Hall from Accessibility Unlocked. We have Ellen Urich from Blowfish Studios and Humphrey Hanley from No Hands, No Excuses joining us in Wellington. I'm going to start with you. How does the world of gaming become part of your life in the first place? My starting point, actually, when I was born, I, I had all my fingers and uh, they've just gradually got worse and worse as I've got older. So I've had the joy, essentially, of uh, learning to play video games when I, I had more fingers and gradually adapting to different technology and different uh, accessibility issues as I've got older. And now the joy is that technology is once again catching up to where my needs are in terms of hardware solutions, 3D printing magic, all sorts of things like that. I discovered Twitch as a platform where people were playing video games, which I absolutely have always loved. And I guess I just really resonated with that whole ability to show what I could do without any fingers, uh, playing the video games that feel like you probably should have 12 fingers to hit all the <laughs> buttons that you need and get to talk to an audience live about what it's like to live with disability, why accessibility is important, and just you know, where the best coffee is. <laughs> right, now we're going to move on to our game developer. Ellen Urich joins us from Sydney. Ellen, welcome to the show. Thanks. Um, I work at Blowfish Studios, which is an independent game developers and publishers in Sydney. Um, I am a senior producer and also the studio narrative director. And at the same time, you're also living with something called POTS. It's short for postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is a form of dysautonomia. It was something that only got diagnosed in my mid-20s when it got really, really bad. And uh, one of the ways that it really impacted on me is, like, I was getting anxious, I was getting depressed, I was getting brain fog, and I couldn't handle a lot of the games that I used to like playing. I couldn't handle the pressure of them, the stress of them. I couldn't respond as quickly as I wanted to. So I really had to sort of reassess the games that I like to play. And so how did that change the way you developed games, your, your day job, I guess? Made me start to look at the way that not only games could be made more accessible, but kind of from the perspective of what a casual gamer is as opposed to a hardcore gamer, especially as people age, for example, they may not be able to play games in that hardcore way as well. And finally, Meredith Hall joins us, uh, co-founder of Accessibility Unlocked. Welcome to the show. Yeah, I'd been in game development for a little while and ever since I had entered being someone with a disability myself, I had seen a lot of my colleagues and friends struggling with the ways in which their disability impacted their working life, their home life. So myself and a friend uh, based over in Wellington as well decided to start an organisation that could support those developers with resources but also support directors of companies who are hiring people in this industry and want to create more accessible workspaces and more accessible games. What are the sorts of things that need to be considered with designing a game for accessibility? When you think about accessibility, you want to be thinking about options. You can't provide every option, um, but you can look at what you're creating with a critical eye and go, OK, if I actually go and ask that person to take a look at what I'm creating and to tell me what their experience is of it, because I don't have that lived experience, you can end up finding a lot of ways that you can embed options into what you're creating that will actually make it more accessible for people. Uh, you know, now there is actually a lot of backlash against developers that might put out what would be, you know, a, a, especially a AAA type game if they haven't taken accessibility into account. It's not just a, it's nice to have for some people, it's more of a, hang on, why haven't you done this now? So is there an example that stands out to you of, of where it's been done well? There's been quite a few uh, recently, uh, things like The Last of Us 2 that has a phenomenal number of accessibility features in it, especially for blind gamers. Uh, there's been some fabulous publicity around that. Other games include several of the Ubisoft titles like Assassin's Creed or Watch Dogs um, had several accessibility things in them. Even a game, uh, Spider-Man, Miles Morales, not only had accessibility taken into account, it also featured characters using sign language as a way to communicate. Wow. Um, so, Ellen, you have actually been actively involved in developing games and you're constantly thinking about this sort of stuff. What was your starting point? 
uh, I think it was 2008, 2009, when I was working on a soccer MMO that was, it's still unreleased to this day, <laughs> just the way the games industry works. Um, but one of the things that I was in charge of was overseeing the way some of the soccer kits might work together for like home and away or just opposing teams. And we actually had about three people on staff that had different forms of colour blindness. So then we were able to actually use those people to help us choose a, a set of kits that would work together and would be very, very readable. Right. I know it's a very big question, but I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around what are the most practical things you can do as a game developer to make something that works for as many people as possible? A very, very basic one is thinking about things like, can we allow players to change the key bindings, for example? Or if there's any voiceovers, are there going to be subtitles? Are we going to make sure that people can actually read it? Even having voiceovers as well as subtitles is in itself an accessibility thing as well. Um, another accessibility thing that people forget about is just uh, difficulty levels of not just having one set really, really difficult gameplay style, but also allowing for people that want to play it at an easier, more kind of casual, so to speak, more accessible difficulty level. As Humphrey said, a lot of these games feel like you need 12 fingers to play them. I know the average person doesn't have 12 fingers, so it's, it's something don't to they? keep in mind as well. Oh, <laughs> I'm no expert. I don't know. <laughs> the um, irony in a lot of that, though, with those titles, especially like the ones that have won awards for accessibility for their inclusivity of gaming, is they're locked to me because they're on a platform mm. where mm. physically I can't actually use the platform because mm. it doesn't have a controller I can hold. Well, this so is what I was going to ask. Is like, what, those, what have been the, 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 like, the developments that have made it actually easier for you? Now, not to sound like a shill for Xbox, but <laughs> <laughs> the Xbox Adaptive Controller has been an incredible advancement. It's essentially just a little box that sits on my desk and has a whole lot of plugs that I can plug in the back of it that then connect to different buttons and switches and pedals under my desk. So not only is it accessibility, it's inclusion as well. Logitech have put out a whole kit of buttons and switches for, I think it's 100 bucks Aussie, uh, something like that, and you get a dozen different kinds of buttons and switches that you can plug into this Xbox thing and set them up however you want them on your desk. It even comes with a little Velcro thing that goes around a leg or an arm so you could attach the buttons whatever limb or finger or whatever it is that help you hit buttons, basically. Is there equivalents out there for other platforms as well? Not that I've come across that don't require you to also have some kind of an engineering degree from what I've seen. <laughs> I don't know if the others have come across any yet, but there are certainly ways of making it happen, but none that are just native plug-in and have fun kind of things. Why is that, Meredith? I think it's a combination of things. I think when you're talking about the independent developers, for a lot of those teams, there's a lot of fear associated with engaging with accessibility. They don't want to get it wrong. They don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. They don't want to ask the wrong question. You do kind of need to have someone in your team that cares about this and is willing to take it on as their thing to manage and their thing to consider. I have worked with a team working on a, a mobile game and one of the things that we did was making sure that we had a long list of all of the accessibility options, details about the game that we could communicate to our audience so that they knew whether or not they could play it before they bought it. A lot of studios don't actually communicate the detailed information about what that experience is like for an individual. And so people look at a game and they go, I don't even know if I can play this. I don't know if I can access it because no one's talking to them. No one's considering them as their audience. And it's the same sort of thing within teams. You would be amazed at how many teams have multiple people in that team who have disabilities, but aren't saying anything about it. They don't want to bring that up. They don't want to have that, you know, have an effect on how they're viewed in their career. But often when those people are given you know, space and permission and support to stand up and say, here are the things that affect me, that has a flow-on effect. That team learns from that. Mm. Humphrey, in terms of where you would like game developers to, to move next in terms of making games that are more accessible to uh, people with a range of different uh, lived experiences of disability, where would you like game developers to, to move next? Well, obviously, you know, just jump ahead to the future where every <laughs> single game that ever gets made is 100% accessible to everybody. But... 
Uh, in the meantime, obviously, <laughs> I think it's about making sure that disabled people are involved in the process, which is what yep. makes what Meredith and the Accessibility Unlocked team are doing so important is opening those pathways for game dev to be accessible as an industry to disabled people as well. I'm actually on a panel with Meredith's co-founder talking exactly about all of these things yep. uh, and including some other panelists who have only recently been able to have those conversations with their employers about their own disabilities, even though they've been in the industry for a while now. Why only so recently have they been comfortable talking about it? What, what's shifted there, do you think? I think it, a lot of it just comes down to people fearing that if they are open about being disabled and those kind of times come up, they could become feel like they're a liability to their company mm. or who knows exactly. Or just what be it viewed is. differently. Mm. When you're applying for a job and you know that you have a disability, there is a, hours of time that you sit there going, Do I tick that box? Do I tick the box on the form yeah. that says this? There is that voice in the back of your head that goes, Are they gonna read that and go, eh? maybe we'll go with this other candidate because it seems like, you know, a, a safer bet. So a lot of the work that we do is trying to educate studios in ways they can make their studio more accessible to, to those people and make those places safer. The flip side of it, ironically, is even though you may feel like a liability and even though the company may see you as a liability, it's actually good business sense to have a more diverse team because it means that the products being created are more appealing to a large number of people. So that means more people will buy the game and hooray, you know, that's what businesses want. <laughs> I was just going to jump in with the fact that I think it's not restricted to game dev. I think it's across yeah, the board yeah. in human resource departments and employment <laughs> relations all over the place that they are, you know, becoming more accepting of accommodations. And it's also about people with disabilities understanding uh, not only their rights, but what support is available, especially in countries like New Zealand and Australia, where we do yep. have various levels of support for accommodations that disabled employees might need. I want to ask you a slightly awkward question. There are a whole bunch of people out there for whom they view this whole discussion as niche and not applying to them. I know there's been a bit of pushback at various different points, people just assuming that it's making games worse or easier or somehow less challenging. And my question to all three of you is, <laughs> what do you say to that person to change their mind? I think something like 98 or 88, I can't remember the exact statistic, of players that play games, play them with subtitles on. Like almost every person that is picking up a game is engaging with an accessibility option, whether they want to view it that way or not. Ultimately, any time that you make a game more accessible by adding options, you are allowing a player to have the experience they want. If you want to go into Dark Souls and absolutely just bang your head against a brick wall of difficulty <laughs> for 20 million hours straight, that is absolutely your prerogative and you should absolutely go and do that. I can't understand why you would want to be concerned with the experience of another person if it's going to make them able to enjoy something that you love just as much. That lets you make more friends, know more people and have access to a, a wider community, which I think is a great thing. The way I play a game does not impact the way that you play or experience <laughs> a game. So why do you care how I play it? If I want to play it for 10 minutes and then say, yeah, I've had enough, I understand this game, it's not for me that doesn't somehow invalidate your experience of yep. playing on the highest difficulty setting and loving it to pieces. So I, I think there is a problem with, you know, that kind of hardcore gamer group where it is so competitive and that is one of their primary drives in playing. I don't know. For, for me, it's just like, look, live and let live. Play and <laughs> let play, right? So just it's not going to hurt you to have a game with accessibility options that you don't turn on. And Humphrey, yes. I'll leave the last word to you. How do you change that person's mind? Well, I mean, they don't want me to change their mind because they don't mm. want to have to face me in a video game where it's actually accessible. They'd rather beat a guy with no hands at a game that only they can play as opposed to playing against me in a game that's been designed with accessibility in mind where they might actually lose the game. So I understand, you know, they want to keep their fragile little world closed off to the rest <laughs> of us, 
But I think actually video games and the community that video games can bring for people with disabilities is one of those places where we are bringing down those walls, where actually the loud, obnoxious gamer dudes that don't want people (laughs) to enjoy video games on any setting are actually becoming the minority almost of gamers. All right, there's lots more of this, a huge half-hour discussion of this which you can find in the podcast. Download the show and it is available now. Thanks, gang. Thanks.